Welcome to Local Matters. On today's show, we're talking about the Telly Awards. I'm glad you asked. The Telly Awards were established in 1979 and annually honor excellence in video and television across all screens from all 50 states and five continents. The winners were announced last month and PAC TV is thrilled and humbled to announce that we have been awarded seven Telly Awards in 2020. Our Creative Media Services Division, which was established in 2018 as a full-service production house to support our nonprofit mission, was awarded two, a silver tally in the category of general recruitment for our project for client onset computer, and a bronze for our alert sentry client project in the category of craft fully animated piece. Here at the local scene, we are delighted to be the recipient of five Telly Awards, and we thought it would be fun to put those projects together all in one show. So let's get started. When I learned about Habitat for Humanity of Greater Plymouth's Veterans Build project, in which four deserving veterans and their families would be provided safe and comfortable homes, I knew it was a story for the local scene. My cameraman Zach and I spent Saturday at the Plymouth Build site to talk to the volunteers and see if we could help inspire others to pitch in too. Habitat for Humanity Volunteer was honored with a 2020 Bronze Telly Award for general recruitment. Here it is. involved with nonprofit work here in the Plymouth general community for a number of years and having joined Habitat this past spring I can tell you that it is so satisfying so rewarding to be part of an organization that truly makes transformative change for individual families that will last not only for one generation for, but for generations to come. I look forward to it every you know as soon as I leave here on Saturday I'm already planning for the next Saturday you know what are we gonna do who's gonna be there. We're out here today building three homes for uh, Habitat families, uh, two of whom are also veterans, and uh, so we're calling it a, a combination vet build as well as a Habitat build. It's always striking whenever, um, you know, whether it's this project or others, when you put the word out that help is needed good people just show up and usually in surprising numbers so um, just another example of people helping other people uh, it's a great thing coming out here today was just amazing seeing all these people coming out here to come together to help the veterans in the community and everything build the houses I really was overwhelmed it, it, it makes me feel very uh, powerful I guess just seeing all these people have come out to help us and are, are lending a hand for a good cause Volunteering is a great way to give back to the community, but also a great way to be part of something really amazing. Especially to give back to our brothers and sisters, um, it's just a great feeling. I, I just can't do enough for my brothers and sisters in need. It's gratifying. I have a different feeling than other people. I feel like I'm a human being and I should be helping human beings. It's very fulfilling. So I love to do volunteer work. I love uh, giving my time to others that need it. And today, the, the outcome um, and the volunteer work, it's just its amazing, it's humbling. It's... The joy and satisfaction you get out of helping people is more than enough pay. It's more than enough overtime. It's, if, if we're, you know, to him who much is given, much is expected, and that's what we look at our company. We absolutely are looking for volunteers to join in the effort to get involved with this incredible work. If you need to volunteer or want to volunteer, this is a great organization to volunteer for. You have such satisfaction in seeing houses built and people getting a home who really deserve a home. It's, it's, it's such a nice thing. Come join the fun. It's a wonderful group, very friendly, uh, very open. If you feel like you don't know enough, you don't have to know anything. They will teach you whatever you need to know. Thank you very much to everybody.
That shoot is where I met Matt Glynn for the first time. I noticed his baseball hat, which had a really cool logo on it, one that was very similar to the local scenes, and I asked him about it. Matt told me about his family and his son Joshua, whom Matt and his wife Karen had lost tragically the summer before. Josh was a musician whose greatest dream was to bring music education to children who couldn't afford it. The logo Matt's hat had was for the Glint Festival, an upcoming music festival to be held in the month of October, Josh's birthday month, to raise money to make Josh's dream a reality. The Glint Foundation Festival promo was honored with a 2020 Silver Telly Award. Let's watch. My name is Matthew Glynn. Uh, I, my wife Karen and I had one child, his name was Joshua Glynn, and he was 32 years old and he was uh, an, in a tragic car accident where he lost his life. And we've decided that we're going to honor his life for who he was and not for the what could have been. Josh was a very admirable young man. He, was, he had a, a, a high level of compassion, uh, extremely intelligent. He got that from my wife, not from me. And he was a good looking kid and uh, he also got that from my wife. So Joshua kind of um, created his own way through life and people followed it, but he questioned things too. He didn't just blindly accept anything. When he traveled to foreign countries, he was in Kenya, South Africa, Haiti, in Mexico, he worked in different orphanages, a number of them in each uh, location. And he would uh, always come back and lament about the fact that these kids are barely able to survive. They'll never have, know the joy of making music, creating music, singing music. And he just used to always talk that someday he'd like to do something about that. And that's where the vision came from. When Joshua was in high school, he uh, went to the Boys and Girls Club and volunteered and um, created a music program there. And he used to teach kids how to play music and to get a little band together. So uh, what's happened is, is we have reclaimed a very small area in the Boys and Girls Club to put in a music room and then we decided to expand it and we're putting in what we're calling the Josh Glenn Musical Annex at the Boys and Girls Club. For us, it's we are sharing God's love through music, and Joshua was the epitome of sharing that love. There's a picture that we have on our website of, of they were taking a picture of an orphan and they were really close to him. And in that orphan's eye, you can see the entire slums behind, behind Josh. And that always struck him and he said, if I ever do my own venture, I'm gonna call it Glint. So we invite you to come to the Glint concert on October 5th from two o'clock in the afternoon till eight o'clock at night. There are four bands gonna be there, food trucks, uh, a beer wagon, wine wagon. Then we would think you'll have a great time and you'll be serving a great cause. Thank you. The festival was a meaningful celebration of Josh's life and legacy. The Joshua Glynn Music Annex at the Boys and Girls Club of Plymouth is now under construction and will be bringing music education to children as soon as possible and hopefully for decades to come. Plymouth Gurnet Light has a rich history and producers Kim Mio, Tiffany Phillips and their fantastic crew worked very hard to tell it. They were rewarded with a 2020 Silver Telly Award for general history. Enjoy. Lighthouses, majestic beacons of light that have enchanted people for centuries. These historic icons have become intertwined in the American cultural landscape. This especially holds true in New England, where lighthouses have become a point of interest for visitors from around the globe. Plymouth Gurnet Lighthouse is one of the many examples of the fascinating stories these relics have to tell. This is the story of Plymouth Gurnet Light.
father, Edward Rose Snow, was an author, lecturer, historian. He taught me that lighthouses are important, that they're special. They symbolize part of our history. I think that Europe has castles, but the United States has lighthouses, and they are our castles. Lighthouses were a navigational tool that were originally used before modern GPS systems, dating back since the times of ancient Egypt. Modern lighthouse structures in the United States have been in existence since the 1700s, protecting sailors from rocky shores and saving countless lives. New England has become famous for lighthouses. These sentinels have become an iconic symbol of the country's founding and a fascinating draw to the region. In fact, New England is home to over 200 lighthouses, including Plymouth Light, also known as Gurnet Light, a 39-foot lighthouse sitting on a 27-acre peninsula located on the northern boundary of Plymouth Bay. Like many of its counterparts, Plymouth Gurnet Light has an interesting story to tell. Gurnet Light was built in 1768. It was first two lighthouses. It was a house with a light at each end. And it was the third lighthouse in Massachusetts, the eighth in the United States, and it was twin lighthouses, so you could tell where you were. Where the um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts decided that the entrance to Plymouth Harbor uh, needed to have some form of an eight to navigation. The, the early tower was a single dwelling with two lanterns on each end. It was not the lighthouse that you look at out there today or the lighthouse that you, you most people recognized as a lighthouse. The wooden lighthouse was designed to be built 20 feet high and 15 feet wide with a lantern on each side, making Gurnet Light the first twin lighthouse in the country. Twin lighthouses were built initially so they could distinguish that lighthouse from the other two lights that were in Massachusetts. And as time went on, more lighthouses were built with different characteristics. Finally, in 1924, the technology caught up to the lighthouses and they were able to have lighthouses flash, like Minot's light flashes 143, um, Graves light is flash flash, and they were able to take down one of our lighthouses, one of the lighthouses at Gurnet Light, so there's just one, and then it could have its own characteristic flash. With all lighthouses came a keeper, a brave soul, who battled perilous storms and desolation and preserved the radiance of the light. For many years, all lighthouse keepers had been male, but Plymouth Gurnet Light holds a special place in history for having the first female keeper. Hannah Thomas, uh, we believe, was born on the Gurnet in uh, 1731. She eventually married at a fairly late age for that period of time, at about 30 years old. And I believe she married her cousin, John Thomas. They had three children together. The Gurnet land itself was originally owned by Hannah's father. And for many years, the Thomas family owned and operated the dairy farm that resided on the land. When her father died, Hannah, along with her husband, John Thomas, inherited the farm and the Gurnet. In 1776, the Revolutionary War was fully underway. In May of that year, General Thomas was appointed to command all American troops in Canada, leaving Hannah Thomas as the sole keeper of the lighthouse. While at war, Thomas contracted smallpox and died, making Hannah Thomas America's first female lighthouse keeper, and as some would say, one of America's feminine icons. She was a single mother. She had three children. She was able to be the lighthouse keeper, to take care of the dairy farm, to do all the things that she had to do and still be a mother. Pretty impressive. So here we have Hannah Thomas, a dairy farmer, a lighthouse keeper, and a pretty smart businesswoman. And I think you can make a case that maybe some of the women's movement began right at Plymouth Light or in Kingston with one Hannah Thomas. After her husband's passing, it seemed that Hannah was on her own. But while many women of her time would have faltered after their husband's passing, Hannah chose to fight. Uh, the war was over. And in 1783, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts said, well, we've got to put the lighthouse back in order again and get it because we need the aid of navigation. And uh, so they had a committee formed to go down and pick a lighthouse keeper. And they were interviewing people for lighthouse keeper. And at one point in time, Hannah Thomas must have raised her hand and said, we got a problem here. 
because if you're going to hire some guy as a keeper here, then you're going to have to take your lighthouse off my land. And because she owned the land underneath the lighthouse, and the lighthouse was leased to, uh, to the Thomas family, and the terms of the lease were that John Thomas or his heirs were to be keeper of the light, and Thomas here. And the committee didn't know what to do, so they go back to Boston. And the Massachusetts legislation actually passes a law allowing Hannah Thomas to be keeper of a granite light. They also paid her 80 pounds per year to run the light, which is 20 pounds more than they paid her husband. Uh, I suspect they were becoming a little bit afraid of her. And then she said, by the way, she said, you built a fort out there and you damaged my dairy farm when you built the fort. I want compensation for that. So again, they passed another law awarding her, actually they awarded her the all the uh, barracks and the structures that were out there uh, for the fort. So Anna Thomas became the first woman lighthouse keeper. Being the first twin lighthouse and having the first female lighthouse keeper in the country are not the only reasons why Gurnet Light has a notable history. In fact, it could be said that the lighthouse has a bit of a peculiar past. The Niger uh, tried to blockade uh, Plymouth Harbor and there was a skirmish between the militia that was stationed at the Gurnet at that time and the Niger and shot a cannon at the uh, lighthouse and, and hit the lighthouse. Uh, it actually was chasing a schooner for a prize. The schooner got away into Plymouth. And so the Niger was anchoring uh, in Sequish Cove right off the Gurnet. They also noticed that there was a party of armed militia at the lighthouse and on the beach. And for whatever reason, the militia in their great wisdom decided they would fire their muskets at a 32-gun British frigate. Probably not the wisest thing to do. Well, as the logbook answered, we, re we replied with our great guns. Whether it was hit by a cannonball or a grape shot, we know that something did happen. And it, um, if it did get hit by grape shot, it's the only lighthouse that was ever hit by grape shot. Throughout the years of its existence, the lighthouse has taken on many different shapes and forms due to various circumstances, including fire, weather, and ever-changing technology. By 1842, the structure was crumbling and the lights were in need of much work. In 1871, a Fresnel lens was installed a lighthouse innovation, since many had complained that the old version of Argand lights were as dim as a house. The Fresnel lens was a game changer. The reason is that the older lights were done with reflectors, and so if you had six reflectors, you had to have six lamps. And for a seacoast light, not only did you probably had 12 lamps on the first level, and then there was another level above that they might have another 12 lamps. So you had an awful lot of open flame to reflect off the reflectors for the light. When the Fresnel lens came, you had one light, and the beam was all gathered into one beam through the concept of the Fresnel lens. Much simpler, much stronger, and could be seen at a much uh, greater distance. Though once a significant resource to Plymouth Harbor, the lighthouse became a victim to depleting commerce. But the opening of the Cape Cod Canal in 1914 gave a new importance to Plymouth Light as a navigational aid to ships transporting to Boston Harbor. In 1924, the Bureau of Lighthouses discontinued the Northeast Tower as the lights were beginning to phase out, thus ending a 156-year run of being twin lighthouses. On March 8, 1977, the Plymouth Light Station was officially recognized on the National Register of Historic Places, an official list of historic structures that the U.S. government deems valuable enough to be preserved for their historical significance. Seeing a need to sustain both Plymouth Garment Light along with its neighbor, Duxbury Pier Bug Light, a nonprofit organization was formed. Project Gurnet and Bug Light is a nonprofit organization that was started in 1983 to take care of lighthouses. Our original uh, lighthouse was Bug Light, Duxbury Pier Light out in the middle of Plymouth Harbor. And later on in 1998, we took charge of Gurnet Light. Our job is to maintain the property and the structures and to educate the public of their historic significance. With Gurnet Light, we have 
the lighthouse itself, all the land that has to be mowed, the keeper's cottage, and then also there is the Revolutionary War Fort, or Fort Andrew, which is, was originally a Revolutionary War Fort and then got expanded during the Civil War. So we have a lot of things to do there. I feel that lighthouses are a part of our history. That's why I'm involved with the organization, to preserve and keep these lighthouses going for the next generation. There are not only concerns about the integrity of the structure of the lighthouse, but also the land that it resides on. Garnet Light is basically five miles out into the ocean. It's surrounded by salt water all the time. We have high winds, we have hurricane force winds every year out there. There's been quite a bit of erosion recently. The fort itself has lost over 30 feet in the last five years. We've had many structures that are in danger of falling over the cliff. Um, we're trying to build a revetment, and we're doing our best to get permitting for that, but it's a long, hard road, and we just hope that we can save things before they've gone. I mean, this is a revolutionary Fort war fort, and it's going to be gone if we don't do anything. The public is just amazed that it's out there. Between the lighthouse and the revolutionary war fort that we have, we've got these two unique structures that have been around for hundreds of years and they're amazed that it's there and, and just the history that we have. The lighthouses are a part of history. We, we can't forget where we came from. They symbolize what happened in the past and we hope that new generations will understand how important lighthouses were and how important lighthouses will continue to be. There are many mariners today who still use lighthouses as a backup navigational system. Symbolically in literature, lighthouses represent the way forward through the treacherous waters of life. But also, Plymouth Garnet Light and lighthouses like it represent a pathway to the past of our very history, a pathway that will need to be preserved for the generations to come. To almost every man and woman, there is something about a lighted beacon which suggests hope and trust and appeals to the better instincts of all mankind. If you haven't made it out to the Gurnet yet, it is well worth the trip. Another trip well worth your time in our area is the Tucker Preserve in Pembroke. We can all relate to the soothing relaxation of a nature hike on a beautiful fall day, but for this next piece, we wanted you to relate to the dog. A walk through Tucker Preserve was honored with a 2020 Silver Telly Award for General Nature Wildlife. Here it is. Golden, crisp leaves falling softly from almost bare trees, lifting and falling in a hushed, gentle breeze, slowly dropping to the soft, cushioned ground, whispering and rustling a soothing sound. Coppers, golds, and rusted tones, Mother Nature's way of letting go. They fall and gather one by one. Autumn is here, summer has gone.
crunching as I walk through their warm fiery glow. Nature's carpet rich and pure that again shall grow. To protect and shield its majestic tree, standing tall and strong for the world to see. They rise and fall in the cool, crisp air. It's a time of change in this world we share. Nature's importance reflecting our own lives, letting go of our fears, and again, too, we shall thrive. Taking a walk through our forests, parks, and nature preserves awaken the peace within us. There are other places here in our towns that are built with the purpose of peace and rest. A walk through Burial Hill Cemetery and contemplation of the souls and lives come to rest there is the subject of our last piece, which was honored with the 2020 Bronze Telly for Craft Cinematography. Nestled on a hillside above Plymouth Harbor is Burial Hill. Sailors, generals, governors, all are equal here. These stones tell the story of lives lived and lost. <laughs> the Pawtucket tribe lived and died here. Used since the 17th century by earliest European settlers, the last burial on these grounds was in 1959. peaceful walk, a reflection on the past. And back into the present. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Local Matters, which is a production of the local scene of PAC TV. We know that Everyone has a story that deserves to be heard. Our goal with the local scene and local matters is to tell the stories and good news of our community because there are so many and so much. From all of us at PAC-TV, stay safe. We'll see you next week.